Hello and welcome to IR Thinker, where international affairs are discussed. I'm Martin Zubko. Recently, I have come across an interesting book title, where three keywords caught my attention – EU, law and geopolitics. Especially in 2022, European security and foreign policy went through difficult tests. On this episode of IR Thinker, I'm curious about what we can learn about the European foreign and security policy. Is there a strong legal framework supporting European foreign policy, especially in today's geopolitical dynamics? I'm joined by Dr. Luigi Leonardo, a lecturer in EU law at the University College Cork, Ireland, and a visiting lecturer in European foreign security and defense policy at Sciences Po in Paris, France. Dr. Leonardo has published two books. The first one, EU Common Foreign and Security Policy after Lisbon, Between Law and Geopolitics, published in 2022. This is the book we will talk about today. Also, there is a second book called Russia's 2022 War Against Ukraine, The EU's Foreign Policy Reaction Context, Diplomacy and Law, published in January 2023. Dr. Leonardo, how difficult has it been to collect all the materials and write a book about the EU foreign and security policy. I mean the first book. Was there any geopolitical slash legal project before that you built on? Okay, good morning, Martin. Martin, thank you for having me. I must say you have a very nice format uh, with these interviews and I'm delighted to, to be here. Uh, thank to, you. Answer, to answer your question, it, um, it is a, a book with a, a bit of a complicated genesis in the sense that it has been in the making for several years, it, it starts from the underlying uh, project of my PhD thesis. I did a doctorate at King's College London where I explored in depth the legal structures of European foreign policy. Um, and the book kind of adds, uh, um, the kind of brings that PhD thesis into a different environment by considering also something outside the legal framework. So that is the underlying legal project, so to speak, that the, um, the structure of it is, um, is given by studies I've done for my PhD. I see. That was, that was an interesting story that you continued from PhD and you wrote a book that is a tremendous achievement. So let's explore the anatomy of the first book. EU Common Foreign and Security Policy after Lisbon between Law and Geopolitics published in 2022. I'm sure you got positive and good reviews about the book. However, today my job is to present the book in a slightly different way. We will discover the main thoughts of this book and we will basically put a context around these thoughts. To many people that might be inspirational talk, and some of them might use the quotes from the book for writing research papers or even books. So let's dive in. Page two, you said, geopolitics and law matter for EU foreign policy. Geopolitics matters in so far as it provides a context for EU foreign policy. Here I have two questions. First one, how difficult is to define the word geopolitics in the EU context, since it probably means different things for different member states? And the second question, what has changed in the understanding of geopolitics in EU in relations to the Ukraine 2022? Yes, certainly the, the word geopolitics needs to be defined because it a word that has been thrown around a lot. Um, the first uh, speech by it, the um, president of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, mentioned uh, that hers would be a geopolitical commission after the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine of February 2022, which you mentioned. Um, the um, um, High Representative for the Union Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Josep Borrell, said this is the EU geopolitical awakening. So uh, it is clear that there is a return, at least in the rhetoric uh, of EU institutions, to the word uh, geopolitics. 
Uh, now, that is uh, the rhetoric of the EU institution. Uh, there is also uh, um, a, an important uh, academic tradition attached to the word geopolitics, which is why I think it's important to start from that definition, because uh, it, it might not mean the same thing to the to, to, to same people, to different people. Um, the tradition of geopolitics is um, born um, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And I'm talking here about geopolitics uh, as a field of inquiry. It is uh, um, um, a spin-off of geography, okay? In, uh, in English, there is a, a scholar who was a geographer um, called uh, uh, Mackinder, who is uh, traditionally considered the father of uh, contemporary geopolitics. And it's interesting because this person was a geographer, um, traveler, but he had also studied biology. And his main idea was that we could find uh, in the world of politics and history some kind of law of the kind that exists uh, in the human body. So um, an all-encompassing explanation uh, that uh, would make sense of the evolution of human history. So his project was particularly ambitious. I think uh, it proved over-ambitious. Uh, it was to find uh, the key to European history. Yeah, but this person is still very influential because for him, the key to, to human history was um, the control of the heartland. And the heartland was the region uh, or the, the, the continent, uh, the, that part of the Eurasian continent uh, that, in fact, is still um, of particular interest and is still particularly sensitive, and we will come back to it, for uh, the European Union. And in particular, it's the area that, that goes from uh, um, the, the I say in the book it goes from uh, the Rhine River to the Volga, so between the two rivers now in Germany and in Russia, um, that comprises vast plains where movement on, on horse or on foot, and now with modern means of transportation is particularly easy. Uh, and MacKinder noted that um, much of European history, the destiny of Europe was shaped by the incoming invasions of the people from the uh, from Central Asia uh, to uh, to Western Germany. And he said, we can account for world's history by considering that the population who controls that part of the world controls, in fact, most of the world, because from there you get to the um, to the sea of Europe and the Middle East, and from there you get to, to the world islands. Now, that is the first, um, if we want, like, for me, a bit crude uh, example of geopolitics. The, the, the thought of geopolitics and geopoliticians has evolved, especially after Second World War, uh, significantly. Uh, the many scholars have added uh, uh, much needed nuance to, to that vision um, by bringing in insights from other social sciences, such as uh, rational choice theory, uh, but also critical uh, critical studies uh, and so on. So the book uses the word geopolitics, but we need to to make clear, I think, two things. First, one thing is what the EU institutions mean with the rhetoric of geopolitical commissions, which um, which has probably little to do with the academic uh, discipline per se. And the other thing is that the academic disciplines per se, in fact, are highly nuanced uh, and have, um, uh, have an important evolution chronologically, but also geographically. So you mentioned geopolitics means something different for each member state. Probably yes. And in fact, there are important national traditions of, uh, of, uh, uh, of geopolitical thought, you know, from Turkey to, 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 to England, to France and these are mentioned. These are mentioned in in the book and in the foreword uh, of the book. Um, so, uh, a unitary mean is is difficult to find. For the purposes of my book, I consider geopolitics to be that niche academic discipline 
um, that is part of human geography and which has an, an important um, an, an important intellectual um, pedigree, even though by background I am a lawyer. Right. And the war in Ukraine has changed this understanding or, or the understanding of geopolitics state the same? Now, the, it, it, there is no denying that it is, as the high representative said, a geopolitical awakening, or it is a tectonic shift, as they say in, uh, in, an, in a new document, the strategic compass to which we will probably need to revert later. And um, it has, I think, in my mind, manifested that what scholars of geopolitics were saying was true, namely that there is a particularly sensitive border. Uh, I, I drew this notion from a scholar of, of geopolitics, of border studies. There is a sensitive border in that area of Eastern Europe. This is something that... Um, that, that Mackinder had already an intuition for. Um, there is, uh, it's something that is, um, you know, it's very suggestive. It's, it does not have explanatory value, but wow. it is suggestive to think that that area, uh, the, the, the Rhine River, was the border of the Roman Empire. Um, it was uh, one of the achievements uh, of uh, the Carolingian Empire to unite the two the two um, sides of the Rhine River, uh, so that the cities uh, in the area are contending the, uh, the, the, the to be the birthplace of Charlemagne, for example. And recently, um, there is an, an important uh, scholar of European law, Professor Dashwood, who said the, the European Union is an antidote to European history, precisely because it tries to integrate the two areas of uh, um, east of the river and, and west of, of the river. So. Um, the the war in Ukraine is a confirmation once more that that area, eastern, which is now roughly speaking, Eastern Germany, Poland, uh, Ukraine, Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia, Belarus, and uh, a part of European Russia, um, is particularly sensitive. It is key to the Euro EU uh, integration process. Right. Thank you. Thank you for this explanation. It was very interesting to to notice those differences because, as you said, geopolitics is a very trendy word, but unless we define it, we can't really work with it. So the next question is related to four concepts that we often hear from Europe, and many people, even some students, they don't really you know, understand exactly what they mean. So we have four concepts. The first one is common foreign and security policy. The second is foreign policy instruments. Third, common security and defense policy. And lastly, the EU security union strategy. Can you yes. please clarify these four concepts or documents for us, for our students, so we understand what is what and why we have four instead of one? Yes, uh, so let's start from the broader umbrella terms within which the other ones fall. And this is common foreign and security policy. Okay. So the European Union has uh, certain areas of competence. Okay, The European Union um, does things grouped under specific labels. So, for example, there is an economic and monetary union, uh, there is a, a common foreign and security policy, there is a competition policy, and so on. So common foreign and security policy is, broadly speaking, uh, relating to the uh, security and defense aspects of the European Union from the outside as opposed to the security and defense uh, of member states from the inside. Uh, for example, when it comes to imagine domestic terrorism, which is instead not a matter for the European Union, but it is a matter for the member states. Now, it goes without saying that the boundaries between internal security of member states and collective security of the European Union um, is a very blurry one. So common foreign and security policy of the Union intersects with 
but is at the same time more than the security and defense policy of the member states and the foreign policy of the member states. Within that um, umbrella, then the European Union carries out certain things. For, for example, it carries out a security and defense policy uh, properly called. So, for example, the European Union, when the European Union sends the military personnel of member states to enforce peace in uh, um, a sub Saharan country, then it is acting within its common security and defense policy. Uh, there are also other, other things that the European Union does that are not part of the security and defense policy, but are part of foreign and security policy more broadly. For example, when the EU imposes sanctions, uh, sanctions against Russia that have been adopted on several occasions last year are a, a foreign policy instrument under the common foreign and security policy. There is also, uh, there is also a, a technical um, um, use of the word foreign policy instruments, which is um, a service within the European Commission, but I don't think that this is, uh, that this is the meaning that is of interest to, uh, to, our, to our audience. So European foreign policy instruments or tools uh, are the actual, um, the actual tools that the European Union can use to carry out its foreign policy. And these are sanctions, these are missions, so civilian missions, sending, for example, um, magistrates, judges, to share their expertise to, with judges in, um, in Kosovo uh, to help with the reform of the, judicia, the, of the judiciary in that country. There are then military operations, uh, as I mentioned, that the European Union can use, for example, to um, enforce uh, um, naval operations off the coast of Somalia to uh, monitor that pirates do not attack uh, uh, ships in, in, that, in that area. Um, so these are examples of you know, Right. Uh, in, in terms of strategy, the European Union has uh, um, also um, the aspirational idea of achieving a security union. Uh, um, this would uh, it would essentially um, mean a fully fledged European uh, defense in which member states. Uh, uh, how can I say? Um, uh, evaporate a bit, um, are completely blurred into a European, a European defense. This is, again, a commitment because at the moment uh, the plans are far from being concrete. It is not clear what form that European defense would take. And then there are also strategic documents, but perhaps we, we will come to it. Right. Come. But, and which, which from these four concepts did you select for your book and why? So the book focuses on common foreign and security policy as a whole because I thought it was sufficiently broad to justify, um, justify a book on it. In yeah. other words, it was sufficiently broad to provide a synoptic overview of the EU's foreign affairs, but at the same time it was sufficiently narrow that uh, it kept the analysis sufficiently focused and it made a precise point and the precise point it helped making a precise point and the precise point being that the European Union you know so far I have mentioned common foreign and security policy I have not spoken about foreign affairs or foreign policy in general and this is because for the European Union common foreign and security policy is one part of its foreign policy normally understood. So for example, it's normal that a state concludes trade agreements with another state, okay? For the European Union, these trade agreements are not part of the common foreign and security policy because common foreign and security policy relates to the defense, to the, to the security and defense aspects. Whereas trade is about commercial aspects of foreign policy. I know the European Union presents this this peculiar, uh, eccentric distinction. Mm -hmm. right. and, uh, and it was important to focus on, on that, to flesh out, to, um, to flesh out what are the challenges really that this legal structure 
creates for the union's diplomacy. Right. Let's continue in decoding the title of your book. And you have After Lisbon. I think you are referring to Treaty of Lisbon. But why is After Lisbon? What, what does it mean as a meaning that after? Now, the Treaty of Lisbon was negotiated in 2007 and it was adopted in 2009, on the 1st of December 2009. It is the latest major constitutional reshuffling of the European Union. So in terms of the EU's legal order, when we look at on what is the European Union based, or based uh, we have to look at the Treaty of Lisbon. So this is why things start from uh, from 2009 um, we also had uh, you know sufficient time uh, a bit more than a decade to draw a first tentative assessment of how the legal system has uh, been put into place and been implemented in practice since then uh, now of course every time we come up with a periodization in, in IR or, or also the way historians do, this is subject to, um, to objection. It, it is um, clearly um, an arbitrary date because, for example, the European Security and Defense, uh, the, yeah, the European Security and Defense missions uh, did not start in 2009. They started earlier, in, uh, 2000, in the early 2000s, 2002, 2003. Um, the first form of uh, of what is now called common security and defense policy, you know, was started in 1999. So why not those dates? True, correct. I could have certainly started earlier, but I decided to start in 2009 because it is uh, um, because it is a, a date with an important constitutional significance. So for EU lawyers, 2009 is is meaningful and it is immediately recognizable as such. There is also within the time frame 2009-2022 an important cesura, which is 2016, the Brexit referendum and the Trump presidency, because from a legal institutional point of view, European foreign policy um, changed uh, in light of those events. So it's nice that the book has the 2009-2016 and the 2016-2022 bec parts, because these kind of divide nicely into um, into two periods, the time frame of the book. Right. Let me let me read a quote from the book. On page seven, the key argument of this book is that the rules on common foreign and security policy contained in the Lisbon Treaty didn't reflect the geopolitical reality that had been created by the 2004 enlargement, a major reordering of political space on the continent. Yes. Can you please elaborate on this a bit? Because to me, it's like, what happened? Like, were authors of the Treaty of Lisbon not aware of this geopolitical change that they, they, they forgot to write? Or how, how was it? Now, every time that somebody reads back to me something that I have written, I think, oh dear, what did I do wrong this time? But no, I agree with, with that statement. I can try to justify it. Um, the, the rules of the Lisbon Treaty foresee unanimity as they did as they did for the longest time for European security and defense affairs, even though for the first time uh, after the Lisbon enlargement, there were uh, not 12, but uh, 25 member states. Uh, not, not the, whatever, sorry, I'm not sure about the numbers now, but yes, there were there was a significant number of new members. There were 10 new member states, okay? Um, plus uh, um, Romania and Bulgaria, so 12 new member states uh, by 2007. The rules of the Lisbon Treaty also uh, foresee virtually no jurisdiction or very limited powers of the Court of Justice, to check that the institutions are complying with, uh, with the rule of law and the, and the basic tenets of the European Union, um, even though there is increased action of the EU in that area. Uh, and uh, uh, these, uh, I think, are a bit anachronistic. In, the in this sense, they do not reflect the new geopolitical reality, essentially because in 2004, 
you have uh, this 10 plus 2, 2007, 12 new member states that join and are a significant, make a significant difference to the system of alliances, to the patterns of energy dependence, uh, to the political and institutional culture of the European Union. So you have this, uh, uh, this new wave of, uh, of accessions uh, that, that does not result in significant changes in the legal structures. In this sense, the, the Lisbon Treaty does not reflect the, the changes, okay? Because there were, in fact, many changes, but in law, not many changes, okay? Were the drafters oblivious to it? Were they not aware of it? I mean, of course, they were aware. But we need to remember that the tre Lisbon Treaty is, is a second best option. It is the result of a failure to adopt a constitutional treaty in 2004. Now, the constitutional treaty was a more decisive step toward federalization. The Lisbon Treaty had to take a step back, at least formally. Uh, it abolished uh, certain, uh, certain things, such as a position of union minister for foreign affairs. Uh, there is only a, a high representative. Um, so the Lisbon Treaty is a bit of a, of, of a step back made by, by the drafters who had to repackage uh, quickly the constitutional treaty, which had been um, rejected in France and the Netherlands. So it's not like they were not aware. It's that it, 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 is, uh, it was not obvious how to market, how to make it politically acceptable. There was no particular political appetite, and we could go on for a long time to, to discuss the positions of, of each member states. Let me just state that uh, the position of England, of the United Kingdom, sorry, and Germany were almost um, diametrically opposite on foreign policy in the sense that the United Kingdom wanted to keep foreign policy uh, as it as it was so separate uh, with little uh, with unanimity uh, with little um, involvement of the European Court of Justice uh, and not affecting NATO commitments whereas Germany was much more integrationist um, in this. So that, that this polarity resulted in a position that is much closer to the one that the United Kingdom that the United Kingdom wanted at the time of negotiating the Constitutional Treaty uh, and uh, the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, there are uh, legal technicalities um, uh, and there are legal issues that I explore in, in the book because politicians are not interested in solving legal issues. And they, they have a different they have different priorities and different uh, interests uh, with a different time frame. Yes, and many times politicians say things in a very simple way, but it's not that simple to implement them into the ecosystem of European Union. It, that's entirely correct. There are degrees of uh, technicalities uh, that require uh, that they require technical expertise uh, that do not really fit uh, into the kind of political slogans that a politician is, is supposed to use for the purposes of getting a message across to the to the great public. Yes. Sure. Well, let's move to page twenty-two of the book. And there is a subchapter called Geopolitics of Energy and Raw Materials, and in which you argue about energy supplies from Russia to the European Union. And I want to ask, is this topic going to be the main geopolitical issue in the European Union? The Okay, so I think that energy security um, and form of independence or autonomy is always the issue for for any community and certainly it is for the european union will it remain the same in the future i would say probably yes even in an era of uh, cyber activities of intercontinental missiles you know one of the key points of the book is geography still still matters and uh, the way you get gas from one place to the other is still very important and i mean we, i think we are tragically uh, all familiar with that 
uh, at least the, our audience will be. And now, if your question relates specifically to Russian gas, then I can uh, Russian um, raw material. I can I can say I can state that for sure it shows once more how that region um, of Eastern Europe becomes crucial, absolutely. Uh, um, uh, the, 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 uh, perhaps the top priority of uh, the European Union. So the management of that uh, of that border, of that um, frontier. Let's call it. Let's call it like that. The frontier, uh, really, of uh, of the new member states, uh, Poland, uh, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania. Uh, the neighbors, Belarus, Ukraine, the Republic of Moldova with Transnistria, um, and uh, the neighbor, uh, Russia. Right. I really like that, that you didn't only focus on the oil, gas and, and raw materials, but there is a chapter in your book, which is like a really excellent one, Geopolitics of Water. So my, my supporting question is, how does the European Union deal with geopolitics of water? Because I think for many viewers and many students, this is not that much common you know, chapter or topic to, to hear about or to, to write about. So, I mean, I was, I was really glad that you included water, which, you know, I think is like, it's, it's basically the basic commodity for humanity because without water, we can't exist. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm also really fascinated by by the geopolitics of water and by by water uh, more generally. Now, um, I will resist the temptation of talking about water within the EU territory, even though there is a geopolitics there as well. But I, I said I will resist the temptation. The let's focus on EU water diplomacy. There is, in 2018, uh, an important document adopted by the Council of, of Ministers of the European Union, which uh, is called the EU Water Diplomacy Conclusions, in which the EU sets out uh, its vision for uh, how to include uh, um, the, the geopolitics of water in its future action. And the priorities are uh, ensuring water security, the so security of supply, for, for the Union, of course, but also for states outside the territory of the European Union, which are uh, at risk for they don't have sufficient uh, um, su sufficient um, uh, water supplies. And that is also meant to ensure sustainability of water, um, of water because it is in the EU's interests as well as in every country's interest to cooperate on this, precisely because it is you know, a fundamental, as you said, element, and because uh, lack of water um, causes uh, or, or scarcity in, in water hygiene causes uh, um, disease, it causes uh, uh, famine uh, and uh, also conflict and ultimately ultimately death. So there is that from the EU um, institutional perspective. Now, the diplomacy of water, what does it mean? Well, first it means that uh, two thirds of all trade in the world takes place through water because it's faster and uh, cheaper to ship things, to carry things through water. Now, um, there are countries such as Russia and the Russian Empire, which were made um, on water in the sense that the expansions of the of the first uh, state of, of now the, of, of the Rus of Kiev took place through um, through water, so <clears throat> through the Dnieper River, um, the expansion of the of the Rus of uh, of Moscow um, took place through the through the the channels of the Volga River. Uh, if we look at a map, uh, imagining how the Russian Empire, the, the Tsarist Empire, expanded, it was precisely through trying to get from Moscow, so, so from, from the center, to uh, to uh, the, the water and to um, to either to um, to 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 Istanbul, to Constantinople, by the way, 
Crimea being an, uh, an absolutely necessary um, harbor for that, uh, but also in Central Asia um, through Afghanistan to, um, to, 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 to water. Um, for the European Union, it's not as obvious that expansion takes place through water. Um, in fact, in the book, then I say uh, the European Union has much more of a heart vocation as opposed to a sea uh, or oceanic vocation. And I, I discuss a bit the concept of Atlanticism, uh, which is the ideal bridge between the two sides of, of the oceans or between Ireland and the United Kingdom and Canada and the United States. Um, and I say paradoxically, you know, um, part of uh, European history uh, is predicated on the uses and abuses of uh, of the Atlantic, abuses because it was used for, uh, for example, slave trade, um, uh, among other uh, commodities that were that were transported, <laughs> were, were uh, coals and diamonds and whatnot, that Atlantic vocation, so that uses of the Atlantic, uh, that geopolitical use of, of the Atlantic, um, so the first to explore the Atlantic were the Spaniards and the, uh, and the Portuguese, um, but they were not the ones who profited uh, from it. Uh, the European history then uh, saw uh, economic prosperity move uh, uh, north uh, to the United Kingdom, to, to the Flanders. Uh, and the European Union now paradoxically it does not have that vocation any longer. The geopolitics of the European Union does not look to the um, to the Atlantic as much as it looks uh, to the heart in the in to, to the earth rather in the heart of the of the continent. So it looks more east than west. Right. In terms of geopolitics and law. You have a fascinating chapter in your book about enlargement of the European Union in the future. But what I would like to clarify is what's the situation now? Because we know that there were negotiations which almost collapse. There are some promises. And we still we, we don't know what's going on with countries like Turkey or countries in Balkans. So before we read the chapter about the future enlargement of the European Union, can you please say a few words about the current stage of the enlargement of the European Union? Sure. So in principle, any European state that shares the values of the European Union is entitled to apply to become a member. That The interesting question is what exactly is an European state? Um, <clears throat> there is no doubt that um, Ukraine, uh, um, who has applied in 2022, uh, but also Moldova, the Republic of Moldova, who has applied in 2022, are European states. And so the current, uh, um, the, the, the current um, status uh, um, is that there are certain candidates uh, uh, in the European neighborhood, uh, Serbia, Montenegro, um, Albania, uh, and as I mentioned, since June, also, uh, also Moldova, and uh, and Ukraine, and they are in negotiation with uh, the European Commission uh, to uh, see how they can implement European legislation, which will put them up to speed um, to join the European Union. The question becomes more difficult when one thinks that in 2022 also another country applied for membership, Georgia. Um, now, to the question, is Georgian European, I, I think the answer is that obviously it is a matter of definition. I can see arguments why it would be European, why it would not be European. Uh, by the way, Georgian uh, became Christian before the Roman Empire did. It's one of those little known facts that I, I put in the footnotes of, of my book. So certainly it shares... Uh, um, in terms of um, of um, historical tradition, much with uh, with Central, Eastern, and Western Europe, um, but there are also arguments as to why it would not be. The fact is, Europe is a country is a continent without a clear Eastern natural border. Okay. 
there isn't um, a significant lack of continuity uh, between between in, in that area that we have uh, mentioned uh, um, several times. So from that lack of a clear physical border, then it's interesting to see how other um, how other political issues arise. So the European Union is at the moment, I think, and this is also a contribution of scholars of geopolitics um, since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, Western Europe is um, in the process of uh, trying to establish a cultural, political frontier, uh, trying to negotiate where that political frontier should be, since there is not a clear uh, geographical one. I mean, uh, that, 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 that Portugal uh, or, or the Azores are the last part of, the, of Europe is, is clear, even though that, even then we could discuss whether the Canaries Islands were part of Europe or not. They were the first frontier in the exploration of the Atlantic. But, um, but, it, but it, it's, it's clearer where the north, uh, southern and western border lie than where the eastern border that, that was that was very that very good explanation because sometimes I speak with my American colleagues and I say like your know, geopolitics is like much easier to explore because you have Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, and that's basically how it is. But in Europe, you have countries, and if Georgia is going to be a member of European Union, I think that's completely different geopolitics after than before. You know, so also the same with Turkey or Balkan states. So therefore, I think in some way, the EU geopolitics is very underrated uh, discipline. And I think we should explore much more in the geopolitical dynamics of European Union. But now let's go for the second theme of your book, which is legal basis, which is law and things related to this. On page 63, you refer to notion of a legal basis in EU law. Can you please explain us what does it mean, a legal basis in EU law? So the European Union is an international organization to which the member states have conferred powers to achieve certain, certain objectives. Now, those powers are, are limited. Um, so the European Union needs to demonstrate when it does something, when it adopts, for example, sanctions against Russia, that it has the power to uh, adopt the sanctions against Russia. In technical terms, we call that the legal basis. So the legal basis is an article of the treaties that says explicitly, uh, that, for example, the Council can adopt uh, measures or uh, the maintenance of international uh, security or, or something along these lines. When the international um, uh, <clears throat> situation so requires, uh, the Council can adopt uh, measures providing for the interruption of uh, economic relations with third countries. And that's how the article is actually placed. Okay, so that is a legal basis. Right, and you mentioned sanctions, and in your book you are mentioning uh, sort of like body code, Coraper 2 which is responsible for sanctions, for preparation of sanctions. Can you please tell us, because sanctions are a very trendy topic for discussions, yeah. like that Coraper 2, what sort of institution or what sort of body or bureau or is it like office and what sort of people are there? So it is, um, it is a body of the European Union. Uh, it is not a decision-making body. It is um, uh, the body of uh, permanent representatives of the member states. That's uh, the French acronym uh, means per the Committee of Permanent Representatives. So these are, um, 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 you know, high-ranking diplomats sent by the uh, member states, diplomats of ambassadorial levels, essentially the ambassadors of for example, uh, Czech Republic or Denmark to the European to, to the European Union. They are in Brussels, they work in Brussels, uh, they are in touch and formally meet every week who prepare the documents for the Council, which meets in uh, uh, the foreign affairs uh, composition. So the Council is the meetings of the ministers uh, of the member states of the European Union. 
The corepere is just the diplomats meeting the day before and preparing stuff so that the right. so that the ministers don't have to start from scratches and the minister have already um, uh, the, the, the insurance that their states, their countries have already reached a level of political agreement. But one of the things that the corepere do does, there are two corepere depending on, on, on the subject matter that they discuss, foreign affairs and sanctions are in corepere too, um, which is the more senior diplomats. Corepere 2, um, among other things, uh, draws, um, puts together lists of, um, of individuals to be sanctioned or negotiates the, the reforms that sanctions, the sanctions should, uh, should take. And like any other instrument of the European Union, it needs to have a, a, a legal basis. That there needs to be a correct legal basis. Right. So now we had a connection between a legal basis between Corepair 2 and let's jump on the little bit more difficult question that I found on page 135 and I, I you, you mentioned I quote the first form of independence is geographical the EU needs a territory and my question is is there EU territory defined in the legal basis of the EU law and the answer is no. So there, there I am um, uh, talking about uh, putting together kind of what we have said so far. No, we're putting together the fact that there is this blurry continents with unclear uh, physical borders, uh, and there is a legal order that kind of needs to fit in it. Um, and the, the first thing that we need is to understand that if the European Union is to exist at all, it needs precisely a territory and it needs a territory it can protect or a territory in which there is, you know, water, electricity and so on and so forth. The fact is that the European Union law depends on the member states for defining what is the Union's territory. So it is not a matter of EU law to decide, uh, to decide this, it is a matter for national, for national law. Uh, just to, to give an obvious example, it's not the European Union which decides what is Cyprus. Uh -huh. uh, the European Union takes stock of what has been agreed by someone else. Right? Right. It is not for the European Union to decide the extent of Serbia. Okay? The European Union takes stock of what has mm. been decided there. Right. So if I say there was an attack on European Union territory, technically or legally, I'm basically wrong because I should mention member states of the European Union? No, I'm not saying that. I am okay. saying that the definition of what is EU territory is uh, derived from the definition of what is the member state's territory. Understood. So Understood. the European Union can only, um, you know, the European Union has a territory insofar as it is the territory of their member states, but it is not for the European Union to to decide on that definition. It, it can only copy paste, so to speak, the definition of, right. to of the it, member to, states. To put it together as a mosaic. Yeah, exactly. Precisely. Precisely. Yes. Okay. Well, let's jump to page 144. And I'm quoting, the need for a functional constitution, does law tend to catch up with the geopolitics? What a fascinating title for the subchapter. And I have two questions here. The EU constitution, is this topic being discussed at the moment or because of failure of the treaty that you mentioned already, this topic was put aside? That's the first question. And the second question, does EU need constitution? Okay, so to put in context the, the sentence that, that you mentioned, I say uh, the Lisbon Treaty uh, has aspects that are a bit dysfunctional because there is the unanimity, because there is little role of the Court of Justice, and then I say if it wants to catch up with geopolitics, then. And I use the word constitution. Technically, uh, again, it is a matter of definitions. Technically, they are fundamental treaties. They are not a constitution. The Court of Justice of the European Union calls them constitutional texts, and it has done so for decades. So, so it, it is 
uh, entirely defensible. Uh, it, it has recently spoken about an EU constitutional order. So, um, so it is it is not unheard of. Uh, but you're right. Technically, there is um, th there was a strong political signal that the that the drafters of the Lisbon Treaty gave when instead of calling it constitutional treaty, they call it the, the Treaty of Lisbon. Right. And there is a currently no, no talks of uh, reverting to an explicit uh, symbolism of uh, using the word constitution. But I think that the, the substance is the same. It's the document that organizes the relationship between uh, powers in, in Europe, so between institutions and between institutions and citizens. Essentially, these are constitution. Right. And in case there is a discussion about this constitution in the European Union, which bodies are discussing this? Do you, like, it, can we name them? Or it's like the general discussion within the European Union on different levels? Oh, the... No, the, there are several procedures depending on how mm, significant the amendments uh, to the treaty are. And there are expedite procedures that only require you know, agreement between, uh, between institutions, essentially. Or there are um, procedures that require uh, the, uh, the, the calling of a constitutional convention. So right. the creation of a new different institution um, for the purposes of drafting um, a convention. And, and recently, um, you, you might have heard uh, about the process of, uh, um, of a constitution for Europe, the process of um, uh, uh, the, an experiment in uh, um, deliberative democracy in which there were constitutional uh, assemblies of citizens uh, um, that well, they were not constitutional assemblies, but there were assemblies of citizens that, uh, whose uh, um, opinions was uh, taken on board uh, for the purposes of uh, um, implementing future treaty changes. Right. Um, so, uh, but again, uh, there was no... Uh, the, the proposals that were fed uh, in from these um, citizens um, assemblies did not... Uh, mm. include the change of, of a word into constitution. Right, okay. On page 116, there is, three great challenges are to be met if the law of common foreign and security policy is to enable the EU to act geopolitically. Can we name a few of those challenges? Because you said there are three challenges. Yes, we can name them. I'm just thinking now whether so to act geopolitically, I I meant to be more functional. And the three challenges are um, are um, the, the effectiveness, uh, uh, coherence, and accountability. Let let me take let me say one sentence on, on each in turn on effectiveness i think that uh, the problem is that you decisions in foreign affairs in, in common foreign and security policy require unanimity even though it is a, a matter um, in front of everyone's eyes that there is no such unanimity uh, at the beginning probably on the 25th of february uh, 2022 there was a degree of or unanimity that was surprising for everyone, probably even for Putin. Uh, but after April, once uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary won by a landslide the elections, we have seen that there was no unanimity, not even on the fact that uh, uh, that, that 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 Putin is is the enemy. Um, <clears throat> The, the the requirement that decisions have to be made with the consensus of all 27 member states is, I think, a bit anachronistic. It simply does not reflect the political realities which create majorities and minorities in foreign policy. When it comes to accountability, I have mentioned the slightly more technical um, topic, but I have mentioned that there is limited power of the Court of Justice to review the act of EU institutions. There is only powers to review um, the, the legality of sanctions. Um, but the Court of Justice has found ways to interpret, uh, um, in, in my view, um, a bit uh, cre creatively um, the, the, the legal text so as to establish more power. So perhaps accountability is the only challenge that 
is currently uh, being met thanks to, to the work of the Court of Justice. Uh, but even then, some might disagree and might say that the Court of Justice should not be the one who who meets a challenge of foreign policy, you know, it should be uh, diplomats and not, and not judges. And, um, and finally, the, the, the third challenge is the one of coherence, because as I mentioned, there is uh, common foreign and security policy, but then there are also uh, trade policy, there is a common commercial policy, uh, there is uh, um, a, a development policy, so um, aid and, uh, and cooperation. Um, they are all part of diplomacy of the European Union, but each time the Union acts, it needs to show that something is done pursuant to the correct legal basis. If the European Union chooses the wrong legal basis because something because the EU thinks it is about foreign policy or security and defense, and instead it is about trade, then the act uh, can be annulled. It is subject to to an annulment procedure. It can be subject to an annulment procedure. It is a, a a waste of time for everyone, and it might also affect the credibility of the union with the negotiating partner, uh, which is which is a third country. So. To sum up, effectiveness, accountability, and coherence are the, the three challenges that, if met, would, would help the union, you know, keep up, keep up in international affairs. Right. The last question for today's interview. I think you sum up things very clearly, and I, I think I, all of us understand what you try to say. But let's imagine that you are the biggest boss of the European Union. What top three priorities would you say that the European Union needs to deal with or to implement in the near future to make the geopolitical and legal framework much stronger so it can act internationally in much better geopolitical position? My position is that we need to come to terms somehow with Russia it, to find uh, um, a way that works for uh, for the EU, for Russia, and for the countries involved in that sensitive uh, in that sensitive area, it cannot be done without a Russian, uh, if not consent, at least uh, um, at least a, a approval uh, or buy in. Let's call it. Uh, the difficulty with that is obviously that. Um, with Putin in power, it's it's very it's very hard. It is politically um, not marketable. When Macron tried to say it last summer, he was uh, um, he was uh, accused uh, of being uh, uh, of Putin essentially. Uh, but I think that um, the top priority is that the war in Ukraine stops and that the um, a, 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 an order that is satisfactory for the parties involved is found without betraying, for example, the people of Ukraine. So without making them feel that they have been sacrificed in order to reach a deal with Russia, without making uh, the people of Europe feel that our values have been sacrificed in order to, to reach a deal with uh, uh, with what is considered the enemy. Um, the, um, that is, I think, that, well, those are the, the two then top priorities. Uh, the, the third the priority, which is in fact strictly linked to, to that one, is uh, the management of the transatlantic uh, alliance, so the management of uh, uh, the alliance between the EU and uh, the United States, and trying to understand from the EU perspective what should be the, 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 the security architecture in the uh, in Europe after after the the war in Ukraine and um, I will not because I will not answer to what I would change because um, because I don't think that there is one magic formula that that can enable the EU to do so uh, but certainly uh, the move to qualified majority more voting so. Um, so adopting decisions by qualified by, by majority and not by unanimity is something that I think 
the European Union is ready for in, uh, in the area of foreign affairs, because that is already the rule in most of EU um, activity, and uh, it can also be the case in the um, in the security and defense policy. Thank you. I'm delighted that we could discuss geopolitics and the law of the European Union with Dr. Luigi Leonardo. I think that his book offers two dimensions, or at least I found two dimensions. The first one is the book offers all answers you can imagine about geopolitics and law. But on the other hand, it encourages you to research even more topics in geopolitics and law. So it opens many chapters to question the function of European Union, the future, the questions about where diplomacy should be. What is European Union diplomacy? So I'm very thankful that I had opportunity to speak about this book with Dr. Luigi Leonardo. Thank you again very much for your time that you join us. And I'd like to thank our viewers for watching us and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. It was a pleasure.